Hello and welcome back to your next class. Today we will be studying about the content of procedural obligations from the context of right to be heard. The case of Baker versus Canada, Minister of Citizenship and Immigration. It is a very important case. This case involved Mavis Baker, a citizen of Jamaica who entered Canada as a visitor in 1981 and never received permanent resident status. She was ordered to deport in 1992 and applied for an exemption from the requirement to apply for permanent residency from outside Canada, based on humanitarian and compassionate grounds. The response to this request was contained in a letter from an immigration officer stating that the decision was made and they were insufficient humanitarian and compassionate grounds and they were insufficient humanitarian and compassionate grounds to process her application, with no reasons given. After being served with a direction to report for removal from Canada, her deportation was stayed pending the appeal. The issue raised in the appeal included violations of principles of procedural fairness and whether the discretion was improperly exercised due to approach taken to the interests of Miss Baker's children. The court held that the principles of procedural fairness were not violated in this case. The duty of fairness in Canadian immigration law requires a meaningful opportunity for individuals to present their case fully and fairly in order to ensure that their interests are protected. The provision of reasons is not always required as a general rule, but in certain circumstances, the duty of fairness may require some form of written explanation for a decision. In this particular case, the lack of an oral hearing was not found to be a violation of duty of fairness as the appellant had the opportunity to submit written information through her lawyer and the notes of Officer Lawrence were considered to be the reasons for the decision, which were sufficient to fulfill the requirement of duty of fairness. The court held that the notes did not give rise to a reasonable apprehension of bias. In conclusion, this case highlights the importance of procedural fairness in Canadian immigration law and flexible nature of the duty of fairness, which depends on various contextual factors such as significance of the decision to the individual, the type of decision being made, and the existence of a statutory right of appeal. Now let's discuss the level and the choice of procedures. The level of procedures refers to the extent to which procedural fairness is required in different situations. Initially, this concept was mainly associated with judicial and quasi-judicial functions but it has since expanded to include administrative functions as well. One influential legal figure who contributed to this expansion was Nicholson, a common law scholar. Talking about the content of procedural fairness required by common law, it's important to note that specific requirements of procedural fairness depend on the context in which decision is made. There is a spectrum of procedural fairness obligations owed, ranging from cases that require an in-person hearing and full disclosure rights to those that only require a written notice and an opportunity to comment. To determine the appropriate content of procedural fairness, the Baker case introduced a methodology that considered five key factors. These factors provide a structured framework for assessing the procedural content of fundamental justice in decisions related to life, liberty and security. Let's take a closer look at these factors. The five factors. The first factor is the nature of decision and the process. This involves understanding the complexity and the significance of the decision being made. The second factor is the nature of the statutory scheme, which refers to the specific legislation or rules governing the decision-making process. The third factor is the importance of the decision to the affected individual. This factor emphasizes the potential impact that the decision may have on someone's life, liberty and security. The fourth factor is the legitimate expectations of the person challenging the decision. This involves considering whether the person had a reasonable expectation of a particular procedure being followed. And the last fifth factor is the choice of procedure made by the agency itself. This factor acknowledges that the agency responsible for making the decision has the authority to determine the appropriate procedures to follow. The Baker analysis had a significant impact on the assessment of the procedural safeguards required under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. It provides a framework that has been widely adopted by trial and appellate courts. However, applying the Baker factors to a Section 7 analysis of the Charter raises some issues, specifically regarding the appropriateness of considering deference to procedural requirements. 
Some may question whether it's appropriate for courts to factor in deference to these standards when analyzing the procedural safeguards required by Section 7. Now let's discuss the case law called Suresh v. Canada. It is a landmark case in Canadian constitutional law. This case dealt with the issue of whether the procedures for deportation under the Immigration Act were constitutional under Section 7 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This case involved Mr. Suresh, a Sri Lankan national who had been ordered to deport from Canada due to security concerns. The court had to consider whether the procedures set up in Section 40.1 of the Immigration Act were sufficient to protect Mr. Suresh's rights. The Supreme Court of Canada applied the five factors established in the case of Baker v. Canada to determine the procedural protections to which an individual is entitled under Section 7. These factors include the nature of the decision, the importance of the interest at stake, the statutory scheme under which the decision is made, the legitimate expectations of the parties, and the procedural choices available to the administrative agencies. The court found that the procedures set up under the Section 40.1 of the Immigration Act, which allowed for a hearing and the right of appeal, were extensive. However, there was a lack of such protections under Section 53.1b of the Act. Given the significant interest at stake, the risk of torture faced by individual if deported, and Canada's commitment to the Convention Against Torture, the court found that Mr. Suresh had a right to procedural safeguards. However, the court also found that the nature of the decision which involved discretion in evaluating future risks and security concerns required a degree of deference to the minister. As a result, the court concluded that the procedural protections required by Section 7 did not extend to the level of a full oral hearing or a complete judicial review process. The case established the procedural protections must be tailored to the nature of the decision and the importance of the interest at stake. It also showed that even in cases where there are national security concerns, the charter protection must still be respected. Now let's discuss specific content issues. In proceedings involving natural justice and procedural fairness, notice is a crucial aspect. There are four common issues associated with notice, including the form, manner of service, time and contents. Written notice is the most common form of notice and personal service, which means notice handed to or told to the party in a personal way, is preferred. In cases where decisions affect a large and indefinite number of people, the means of giving notice may be specified by legislation and is usually in the form of public notice. In situations where legislation does not specify the type of notice, courts allow notice to be given in a public way. Giving notice by mail creates the possibility that it may not be received in time or not at all. The crucial date, which is the date on which the notice is given, can be the date of mailing or the date of receipt depending on the case. Notice contents are also crucial and should provide sufficient information to the recipient to prepare for the hearing adequately. Failure to provide proper notice may violate the principles of natural justice and procedural fairness which may lead to the invalidation of the decision. Now let's discuss the case of Race City of Winnipeg and Torchinsky. This case dealt with the interpretation of the time limit for appeal applications in the City of Winnipeg Act. The issue arose when the assessor sent a notice of assessment to Torchinsky, which included the right to appeal and gave May 12 as the date of beginning the hearings. However, the notice did not arrive until May 12 and Torchinsky gave notice within a few days. The city sought to prohibit the Board of Revision from hearing the appeal, arguing that the notice of appeal was late. Judge Dewar ruled in the favour of Torchinsky, stating that the time limit for notice was not subject to the extension or variation. The purpose of Section 183 was to preserve the validity of an assessment and did not affect the right to complain, although the choice of mail was unfortunate. The judge determined that if the specific date did not subject to extension or variation, then it is as if the notice has not been given. In summary, the decision was that the Board of Revision could not hear Torchinsky's appeal despite the late arrival of notice. This case highlights the importance of complying with time limits for appeals and potential consequences of missing those deadlines. Moving on to the next case, which is Ray Rimmel and Niagara Escrapment Commission, which involved a dispute over time frame for appealing a ministry decision. 
the landowners had 14 days to appeal from the date ministry mailed its letter but in this case the notice arrived late the notice was mailed on september 8th 1980 but one owner did not receive it until september 17th which is 9 days later the owner immediately mailed a notice of appeal but it did not arrive until september 23rd which was one day late the owner sought to have minister's decision prohibited from consideration but the court ultimately found that the unreliability of the mail system and disruption of mail at the critical time were reasons for not granting the judicial relief sought as a result the decision was in favor of the minister and the owner's appeal was not considered this case highlights the importance of understanding and adhering to legal time frames which also recognizing the extenuating circumstances can impact the ability to meet those time frames in the next case of wilkes versus canada the legal issue was whether citizenship and immigration canada the cic was entitled to rely on the address provided by the applicant for the delivery of notice the applicant wilkes had applied for permanent residency in canada and was required to attend a hearing with cic however wilkes failed to attend the hearing and cic made a decision without him Wilkes argued that he never received the notice of the hearing as the address provided was incorrect. The federal court decided in the favor of CIC and held that administrative decision makers are entitled to rely on the addresses provided by the parties for the delivery of notice. The court stated that it would not be practical to expect administrative decision makers to independently verify the accuracy of the addresses provided by the parties and that it would be the responsibility of the parties to provide the accurate information the ratio of the case is that administrative decision makers are entitled to rely on addresses provided by the parties for delivery of notice and it's the responsibility of the parties to provide the accurate information this case highlights the importance of providing accurate and up to date contact information to administrative decision makers to ensure that the parties are given notice of hearings and decision Moving on to the next case Zelioni versus Red River College the case of Zelioni versus Red River College dealt with the issue of notice in a legal proceeding the plaintiff Zelioni had brought a claim against the college for wrongful dismissal the college scheduled a hearing but failed to provide a sufficient notice to the plaintiff about the date and time of the hearing the legal issue in this case was whether or not the notice provided was sufficient the court decided that the notice was insufficient because it did not give the parties enough time to prepare for a hearing this case highlights the importance of providing adequate notice in legal proceedings and the consequences of failing to do so it also shows that in some cases the defect in the notice can be redeemed through an adjournment but the remedy may always not be available in all cases the next case is r versus ontario racing commission in this case the legal issue concerned the contents of a notice the court held that for a notice to be considered sufficient it must contain enough information about the issues it addresses such that the parties receiving the notice are able to prepare a response the rationale behind this decision was to ensure that the parties are given fair opportunity to prepare and present their case and that the hearing is conducted in a manner that is consistent with the natural justice and procedural fairness this case highlights the importance of including specific information in notices particularly in legal proceedings without such information parties may not be adequately prepared to participate in proceedings which can lead to unfair outcomes therefore it is essential for those responsible for issuing notices to carefully consider the information that needs to be included and to ensure that the parties are given sufficient time and resources to prepare their response the next case is canada attorney general versus canada Commission of Inquiry on the Blood System in Canada. It is a 1997 case in the Supreme Court of Canada regarding a public inquiry into the blood system in Canada. The Commission of Inquiry appointed to examine the blood system had held exhaustive hearings and sent out confidential notices on the final day of the hearing that it might reach conclusions based on the evidence that would amount to misconduct. Some of the recipients of the notice bought applications for judicial review. but the federal court and the federal court of appeal dismissed most of the applications the supreme court of canada held that the notices were within the commissioner's mandate to investigate and did not exceed his jurisdiction 
the court also stated that a commission of inquiry is not a court or tribunal and has no authority to determine legal liability and should avoid setting out conclusions that are couched in specific language of criminal culpability or civil liability. The court further held that notices warning of potential findings of misconduct if issued in confidence should not be subject to strict scrutiny as the formal findings. The court also held that the commissioner did not exceed his jurisdiction in the notices and the commissioner stated that he would not be making findings of civil or criminal responsibility and that the use of words failure and responsible in the notices did not mean that the person breached a criminal or a civil standard of conduct. The procedural protections offered to parties and witnesses were also considered extensive. The, therefore, the appeal was dismissed. Okay, now let's talk about discovery. Discovery is a key pre-trial stage in civil litigation in Canada. It is a process where the parties exchange information and evidence relevant to the case. The purpose of discovery is to promote settlement and narrow the issues for trial, which can save time and resources for both parties. The process is mandatory in all Canadian civil litigation and is governed by the court rules. During discovery, each party has the opportunity to ask the other party questions and request documents related to the case. This can include witnesses' statement, expert reports and any other relevant evidence. The parties are required to answer honestly and to the best of their knowledge. Failure to do so can result in penalties or sanctions. Discovery can be conducted in different ways, including written questions, oral examinations, and requests for documents. The process can be time-consuming and costly, but it is an important step in preparing for trial. Overall, discovery is a critical component of the civil litigation process in Canada. It promotes transparency and fairness by allowing each party to obtain relevant information and evidence. By narrowing the issues for trial and encouraging settlement, it can also help to reduce the time and cost of litigation. Now let's discuss the case of CIBA JIG Limited v. Canada Patented Medicine Prices Review Board. Pardon me if I did not pronounce it right. The issue at hand was the extent of disclosure required by the Patented Medicine Prices Review Board to the appellant. The board was holding a hearing to determine if the drug habit troll being sold in Canada by the appellant was being sold at an excessive price. The consequences of a finding of excessive pricing could include a price reduction or payment to the Canadian government. The motions judge upheld the board's decision to refuse disclosure of requested documents and the issue between the parties was the effect of the reasons given in the Stinchcomb case by Justice Supinka. The court agreed with the motions judge that procedural fairness is variable and its content is to be decided in each specific case. However, the court also noted serious economic consequences for an unsuccessful patentee at a Section 83 hearing and the possible effect on a corporation's reputation in the marketplace. Ultimately, the court concluded that the criminal standard of disclosure was not required in an administrative setting, regardless of the potential economic severity. The board had economic regulatory functions and had no power to affect human rights in the same manner as criminal proceedings, which meant that the board had some leeway in pursuing its mandate. Okay, moving on to the next case, which is Clifford versus Ontario, Attorney General, 2008. We are looking at an issue of procedural fairness in a pension dispute now. The Ontario Municipal Employees Retirement System, or OEMRS, the mind that Ms. Campbell was the common law spouse of the deceased, Tony Clifford, and, and thus entitled to his pension benefits. However, Sylvia Clifford, Tony's ex-wife and a named beneficiary applied for judicial review, claiming a breach of procedural fairness. She argued that there was a failure to order full oral discovery of fitness under the oath before the hearing. The court held that the duty of procedural fairness is flexible and depends on the circumstances of the particular tribunal and the issues involved. In this case, the tribunal was of a formal hearing similar to a trial in a civil court, and Sylvia Clifford had a reasonable expectation for full disclosure of the case. However, the tribunal did have in mind the principle of procedural fairness and required the exchange of witness statements, but not sworn affidavits or full oral discovery under oath. 
It's important to note that a tribunal is a master of its own procedures and is not required to adopt procedures of a civil court. Furthermore, the court emphasized that a right to prior oral discovery is not an essential ingredient for a fair hearing. In this particular case, there was ample disclosure of the case, so the application for judicial review was ultimately dismissed. Now let's discuss delay in administrative proceedings. In the context of administrative proceedings, delay refers to the passage of time between the initiation of proceedings and the final outcome. It is important to understand that delay can impact the rights of parties involved as it may affect their ability to adequately respond to allegations or make an argument. The Supreme Court of Canada, in the case of Blenco v. British Columbia, acknowledged that the delay in administrative proceedings could be seen as a breach of natural justice or procedural fairness. There are two possible ways that delay may be considered as a breach. First, in its impact on a person's ability to respond to allegations. And second, as an abuse of process. However, the court also pointed out that it can be challenging to make either argument under the Charter of Rights and Freedoms or the common law of procedural fairness. Despite these challenges, it is crucial to recognize the potential impact of delay in administrative proceedings on the rights and fairness of the process of the parties involved. In the case of Saskatchewan Human Rights Commission v. Cordelas, the Supreme Court of Canada dealt with the legal issue whether the delay in remedial proceedings, specifically a human right complaint, was a breach of individuals' right under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Section 7 guarantees the right to life, liberty, security of a person, as well as the principles of natural justice. The majority decision in this case was that the delay was prima facie unreasonable and entirely the fault of the Commission, thus constituting a breach of the individual's right under Section 7 of the Charter and the principles of natural justice. The reasoning behind the decision was based on three factors outlined by Beda, B-A-Y-D-A, who dissented in part. These factors included, first, whether the delay complained of was prima facie unreasonable in light of the inherent time requirements of the remedial proceeding, the reason or responsibility for the delay taking into account the conduct of the complainants, the tribunal and the affected individual, third, the prejudice or impairment caused to the individual by the delay. Now let's talk about actual hearing. When it comes to actual hearing in administrative proceedings, there are two main types of hearings, oral and written hearings. Traditionally, an oral hearing was considered a requirement of natural justice. However, with the emergence of principles of fundamental justice, the requirement of an oral hearing is no longer a hard and fast rule. The choice of whether to hold an oral or written hearing is left to the discretion of the decision maker in many cases. For example, in Nicholson case, the Board of Commission of Police was given the discretion to choose between an oral or written hearing. In Baker, the Supreme Court upheld the decision of an immigration authority to hold a written hearing. In cases involving rights protected by Charter and Bill of Rights, an oral hearing may be required. This can be seen in the Singh case, where the lack of an oral hearing was considered a violation of principles of fundamental justice. However, in Kindler v. Canada, it was held that an oral hearing was not required in an extradition process. Ultimately, the necessity of an oral hearing often depends on specific cases. It is often seen as necessary in cases where credibility is an issue. However, the view is not unchallenged and there are situations where other evidence gathering methods are preferred, such as in sexual harassment complaints where the trauma of a face-to-face -face confrontation may act as a barrier to formal complaints being lodged. In the case of Masters v. Ontario, the plaintiff Masters was the Ontario Agent General in New York. Following complaints of sexual harassment against him, an external investigation was conducted. The investigation resulted in a report indicating that Masters had sexually harassed seven women. After responding to the report, Masters was reassigned to another position. But he resigned and applied for judicial review alleging various breaches of natural justice in the investigation process. The court's decision addressed central submissions of the plaintiff's counsel, which claimed that an impartial decision-maker must first determine the credibility in a full trial-type hearing. The court found this argument to be without merit. It noted 
that decision making and investigation focused on specific allegations of sexual harassment with the well being of women involved and needed for harassment free workplace being pressing concerns. The court noted that decision making and investigation focused on specific allegations of sexual harassment with the well being of women involved and the need for a harassment free workplace being pressing concerns. The court concluded that the Premier was exercising a prerogative and therefore the duty of fairness did not require a trial type hearing before an impartial decision maker. Instead, all that was required was that the government provide an opportunity for witnesses to be questioned. The court also found that the investigators were not obliged to obtain further responses from masters as, as they were following the procedures outlined in the Workplace Discrimination and the Harassment Prevention Directive. In summary, the court held that the duty of fairness did not require the government to use its coercive powers to direct witness to subject themselves to counsel's questions and that Masters was given the opportunity to make legal arguments and respond to additional details. Moving on to the next case law, Khan, Khan v. University of Ottawa. In this case, Mr. Khan was a former student of University of Ottawa. He was expelled from the university on the grounds of academic misconduct. Mr. Khan brought an action against the university claiming that the process used to expel him was fundamentally unfair and in breach of procedural fairness. The legal issue in this case was whether the university's expulsion of the plaintiff was in breach of procedural fairness. Procedural fairness is a requirement that the administrative decision makers provide individuals with a fair and impartial hearing before making decisions that affect their rights and interests. The court held that the university's expulsion of Mr. Khan was in breach of procedural fairness. The court found that the university failed to provide him with a fair and impartial hearing as it relied on hearsay evidence and did not give him an opportunity to cross-examine the witness. The ratio dissidenti of this case is that administrative decision makers have a duty to provide individuals with a fair and impartial hearing before making decisions that affect their rights and interests. The duty includes the right to be heard, the right to call and cross-examine witnesses and the right to have evidence tested in a manner that is consistent with the principles of natural justice and fairness. In order to meet this duty, administrative decision makers must provide individuals with a fair opportunity to be heard and make decisions based on evidence that has been properly tested and evaluated. The next case that we will be discussing is Ottawa Police Force versus Lalande, 1986. This case was heard in the Ontario Court of Appeal, where a senior police officer faced disciplinary proceedings for having sexual relations with prostitutes while on duty. The officer requested to have the hearing held in camera which means in private, away from public and press. However, this request was rejected by Judge Hogg. In his decision, Judge Hogg expressed the importance of the press table in the courtroom or hearing, comparing it to other essential elements such as judge's bench, witness box or counsel table. He emphasized that reporters serve as a neutral link between the court or hearing and the public and that they should be allowed to listen to the evidence and submissions. Judge Hogg further stressed the principle that unless there are compelling reasons to the contrary, a hearing that affects the public should be open to all citizens. He found that the circumstances of the case did not outweigh the desirability of adhering to this principle. In this case, the principle of open hearings was upheld, as Judge Hogg's decision favoured open hearings. The ratio or the legal principle established by this case is that unless there are compelling reasons to the contrary, a hearing that affects public should be open to all citizens. I hope you are making notes of all the ratios that are being established through these cases. If you are able to connect these cases to your exam questions, you will get bonus marks, I assure you. So definitely make like a small index. And if you end up purchasing my exam notes, you will get them anyways. But do try to keep notes of everything. And, and if you have already purchased my notes, while I'm going through it, while I'm reading through it, keep on flagging everything. Okay, moving on to the next topic, which is the right to counsel in hearings and trials. The right to counsel is an essential legal principle which ensures that individuals involved in a hearing or trial have the right to be represented by a lawyer or an agent. 
In many cases, this right is assumed and is often provided for by the law. However, it is important to note that the extent to which this right applies may vary and can be subject to limitations. In some cases, the right to counsel may only apply to parties involved in hearing or trial, while in others, witness may also have this right but with certain constraints. Additionally, the right to counsel can be limited in terms of the level of participation allowed for the counsel and the choice of the counsel. In summary, the right to counsel is an important aspect of legal proceedings that ensures fair representation for those involved. However, it is crucial to recognize the potential limitations and variations in the application of this right across different contexts. In the case of Ray Men's Clothing Manufacturers Association of Ontario and Toronto Joint Board, Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Unions, 1979, there was a dispute in the men's clothing industry in Toronto, where, where disputes were typically resolved through arbitration without the involvement of lawyers. The Men's Clothing Manufacturers Association of Toronto wanted to change this practice and use lawyers for some disputes, which led to the dispute at hand being brought before an arbitrator. The key legal issues in this case were whether a party to arbitration proceedings under the collective agreement has an absolute right to legal representation, and if not, whether the arbitrator's discretion should be exercised to permit representation. The arbitrator initially ruled that Men's Clothing Manufacturers Association of Ontario could not be represented by legal counsel. However, the court overturned this decision, stating that the arbitrator had no authority to limit the rights of parties entitled to appear before him by agents and the arbitrator erred in law. The court held that the right to counsel is not an absolute right, but the extent to which it applies may vary and may be subject to limitations. The court also held that the right to counsel can be limited in terms of the level of participation allowed for the counsel and the choice of counsel. In this case, the court held that the natural justice required the company to be represented by legal counsel at the arbitration hearing without any limitation despite the fact that they did not have an absolute right to counsel. Next case law is Ray Parrish from the year 1993, which dealt with the legal issue of whether a witness in a Canadian Transportation Accident Investigation and Safety Board Investigation under Section 14 was entitled to have counsel present during the investigation. In this case, the captain of a ship involved in a collision was summoned to appear before the investigator appointed by the board. However, the investigator refused to allow the captain to have counsel present, leading, leading the captain to refuse to testify. Leading the captain to refuse to testify. The board asked the Federal Court Trial Division for a decision under Section 18, Subsection 3 of the Federal Court Act. In the decision, the court acknowledged that the enabling legislation for the board and the Restrictive Trade Practices Commission contained many similarities, but also pointed out important differences such as the ability to make transcripts public and the impact of the inquiry on individuals' rights and livelihood. The court concluded that the presence of counsel was implied by the duty to act fairly, taking into account factors such as whether the witness was subpoenaed, requiring to attend and testifying under oath with a threat of penalty, if absolute privacy was not assured, if the reports were made public, if an individual could be deprived of their rights or livelihood, or if some other irreparable harm could ensue. The court acknowledged that the board and tribunal are masters of their own procedure, but the presence of counsel was necessary to protect the witness's right and reputation. In the next case, R vs. Secretary of State for the Home Department, Ex parte Tarrant. In this case, five prisoners were charged with disciplinary offences in a prison and their requests to be represented by counsel were refused by the Board of Visitors. The prisoners sought a writ of certiorari to quash the decision made against them and were successful. The court held that while there was no common law right to counsel in prison disciplinary proceedings, the Board of Visitors had the discretion to allow representation which was derived from their general power to regulate their own procedures. Judge Webster laid down six factors that the board must consider when exercising its discretion in granting counsel privileges. These factors include 
the seriousness of the charge and potential penalty, the presence of any legal issues, the capacity of prisoners to present their own case, procedural difficulties, the need for reasonable speed and the need for fairness. The board had failed to consider these factors in denying the prisoner's request for representation by counsel. The next case is Howard versus Stony Mountain Institution. In this case, the appellant, Howard, requested an order to prohibit the respondent, Stony Mountain Institution, from continuing or concluding the hearing of certain charges against him under Section 39 of the Penitentiary Service Regulations in the absence of legal counsel. The issue in this appeal was whether the refusal of the request was unlawful. Judge Thurlow concluded that the Supreme Court's decision in Martin U did not create an absolute right to counsel for the appellant in disciplinary proceedings. Instead, the right to counsel would depend on circumstances of the particular case, including its nature, gravity, complexity, and the capacity of the inmate to understand the case and present a defense. The fact that the appellant's earned remission was in jeopardy and the presence of a charge of an act calculated to prejudice, discipline, and good order, a difficult charge to defend, suggested the need of counsel. However, the presiding officer's decision to deny the request was not referred to as a matter of discretion but as a matter of right where the circumstances called for representation by counsel. In conclusion, the decision in this case was that Section 7 of the Charter, the right to life, liberty and security of the person, did not create an absolute right to counsel in all such proceedings and whether or not the person has a right to representation by counsel will depend on the circumstances of a particular case. The next case of New Brunswick Minister of Health and Community Services versus GJ 1999. This case focused on the right to counsel under Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The issue at hand was whether Section 7 required that a mother be provided with counsel when resisting an application by child welfare authorities for renewal of an order placing her children in state custody. The policy under the Legal Aid Plan prohibited the granting of legal aid certificates in such proceedings. The Supreme Court of Canada found that the mother's right to a fair hearing required representation by counsel. This conclusion was based on seriousness of the interests at stake, the complexity of the proceedings and the capacities of the mother. The court emphasized that the interest at stake in custody proceedings were of the highest order and that the state was seeking to extend a previous custody order, which was significant given the fact that the mother had already been separated from her children for over a year. The court also concluded that an unrepresented parent would need to possess exceptional capacities to effectively present their case in such serious and complex proceedings and that the mother did not possess such capacities. The court engaged in a Section 1 analysis and found that the potential restriction on mother's right to security of the person would not have been in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice if the custody hearing proceeded with the mother unrepresented by counsel. The court found that the objective of limiting legal aid expenditures was not of sufficient importance to deny the mother of a fair hearing and the additional costs of providing state-funded counsel were insufficient to justify the violation of mother's right to security of the person. Now let's discuss disclosure and official notice. This refers to the requirement for parties in a legal matter to provide each other with information and evidence relevant to the case. The principle behind this requirement is that each party is entitled to know what evidence and representations have been made by the other side and to have an adequate opportunity to respond. The importance of disclosure and official notice lies in ensuring a fair and transparent process. By, by allowing both sides to have access to all the information they need to make their case. This requirement helps prevent surprises and encourages a thorough examination of evidence. The importance of disclosure and official notice lies in ensuring a fair and transparent process. By allowing both sides to have access to all information they need to make their case, this requirement helps prevent surprises and encourages a thorough examination of evidence. Additionally, it provides both parties with the opportunity to challenge the evidence of the other side, fostering a more equitable and balanced legal proceeding. In the next case, in Kane versus 
Board of Governors of UBC. The legal issue was whether the Board of Governors of the University of British Columbia or UBC violated the principles of natural justice when it held a meeting without the presence of Dr. Kane, a professor at UBC, who was suspended for improper use of computer facilities and deliberated on the case after the hearing. Justice Dixon, in his decision, stated that the board was under the obligation to postpone further considerations of the matter until Dr. Kane was present and heard the additional facts presented, or at the very least, the board should have made Dr. Kane aware of those facts and afforded him a real and effective opportunity to correct or respond to any adverse statements made. The board's failure to do so was a fundamental error. Justice Dixon emphasized that disclosure is a basic element of the common law of natural justice and is usually required unless some competing interests prevail. The justification for this requirement is to enable the party to know and respond to information that the agency has and that may influence its decision. However, limits are placed on disclosure in the name of confidentiality claims of various kinds. The ratio of this case is that the Board of Governors of UBC violated the principles of natural justice by holding a meeting and deliberating on case without the presence of Dr. Kane and by failing to disclose him the additional facts presented at the meeting, thereby denying him a real and effective opportunity to respond. The next topic is access to information statutes. Access to information statutes refer to laws in Canada that provide for freedom of information and privacy. These laws may be used to obtain information in preparation for a regulator hearing as a substitute for pre-hearing discovery. However, these laws may be used to obtain information in preparation for a regulator hearing as substitute for a pre-hearing discovery. However, just because information is exempt from disclosure under freedom of information laws, it does not mean that it will be denied in proceedings governed by the rules of natural justice and procedural fairness. In Canada, the Freedom of Information Act specifically states that it does not prejudice other laws that govern access to information including laws of natural justice and procedural fairness. The next topic is Crown or Executive Privilege. At the federal level in Canada, the law of Crown or Executive Privilege has been codified in Canada Evidence Act. This privilege applies to proceedings before administrative agencies. Outside of the federal domain, the matter of crown or executive privilege is still regulated by common law. In Cary v. Ontario, the Supreme Court held that there is no room for absolute privilege and that the last word or any claim for privilege rests with court, not the executive. The spelling of this case law is C-A-R-E-Y, Cary v. Ontario. The common law also provides for various other forms of privilege, such as solicitor-client privilege and adjudicative privilege. The difficulties in deciding on the existence and the extent of a case to disclosure usually arises from competing interests. This can be demonstrated in four groups of situation. First, an individual may wish to know information that an agency has collected about them. Second, an individual may wish to know the identity of persons from whom an agency has collected information about them. Third, businesses may wish to know, businesses in this case, businesses may wish to know the information that an agency has collected about them, often as a part of application. And last, any party, in this case individuals and businesses both, any party may wish to know the information that an agency has created itself, such as staff reports, guidelines or policy statements. Now let's talk about access to agency information. This refers to the problem of accessing files of workers' compensation boards, especially medical reports in those files. Three arguments have been made for disclosure. First, the belief that the individual should have the right to know what the government knows about them. Second, Disclosure would increase the effectiveness of workers' participation in the decision-making process by enabling them to respond to information used by the board. Third, the disclosure would improve the quality of the reports by exposing carelessness and vagueness. An important reason for refusing disclosure is the attitude of the doctors who fear litigation 
who fear litigation and a reduction in the frankness and the detail of their reports. Let's discuss the case of Ray Napoli versus British Columbia Workers' Compensation Board. The legal issue was whether the judge was correct in finding that the boards of review and the commissioners of the WCB Work Workers' Compensation Board breached the rules of natural justice in failing to give the worker full opportunity to peruse his file when he appealed from the original decision of a disability awards officer or commissioner. The court held that the rules of natural justice applied to proceedings before the boards of review and the commissioner and the files should be disclosed to the workers. The court found that the four-page summary of the information in the workers' file provided by the WCB compensation consultant was not sufficient to satisfy the requirements of natural justice. The court stated that more disclosure is required when contentious statements are made about the individual, especially ones that have effect of threatening his livelihood. In these circumstances, a high standard of justice is required, especially since the individual's future will be largely shaped by the decision of the final domestic tribunal. The decision of the court was that the provision of summaries was not sufficient compliance with the rules of natural justice in the circumstances of this case. The ratio of this case is that the extent of disclosure provided by the agency of information it has gathered on the individual must be sufficient in the circumstances to comply with the rules of natural justice. The ratio of this case is that the extent of disclosure provided by the agency of the information it has gathered on the individual must be sufficient in its circumstances to comply with the rules of natural justice. The next case, Charkawi versus Canada. The Supreme Court dealt with the issue of constitutional rights to procedural and the duty to disclose evidence under the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Respondent Minister signed a security certificate against Charkovi under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, which resulted in his arrest and detention. A document that should have been disclosed earlier was discovered and fresh allegations were filed against Charkovi based on previous undisclosed information. The Supreme Court held that the destruction of operational notes by the CSIS was a breach of their duty to retain and disclose information which derived from the Canadian Security Intelligence Services Act and case law on disclosure and retention of evidence. The court found that the CSIS policy on the management of operational loads was based on an erroneous interpretation of the provision and the notes should be retained when conducting an investigation that targets an individual or group. The court recognized a duty to disclose evidence based on Section 7 of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms which goes beyond the mere summaries to protect individuals' right to life, liberty and security of the person, which can be placed in serious jeopardy by the security certificate procedure. The court ordered CSIS required to retain all information in its possession and to disclose it to the ministers and the designated judges for the purpose of protection the right and procedural fairness of individuals in Charkoi's position. The decision of the Federal Court and the Federal Court of Appeal was allowed in part and the application for a stay of proceeding was dismissed. Coming to the next case, in the case of Canada Citizenship and Immigration versus Harkat, the Supreme Court of Canada dealt with a security certificate issued against an individual named H under the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act, the IRPA, alleging his engagement in terrorism. The main legal issue was whether the IRPA scheme requires an incompressible minimum amount of a disclosure to the named person. The court found that the IRPA scheme must be interpreted as recognizing that the named person must receive an incompressible minimum amount of disclosure. The named person must be reasonably informed of the minister's case, meaning that he must have sufficient disclosure to know and meet the case against him and also to be able to provide meaningful instructions to his public counsel and guidance to his special advocates. The level of disclosure required is case-specific and the judge is the arbiter of whether the named person is reasonably informed. At a minimum, the named person must know the essence of the information and the evidence supporting the allegations. The IRPA scheme also mandates that the named person must remain reasonably informed throughout the proceedings 
and if the named person is not reasonably informed, the proceeding will not have been in compliance with the IRPA scheme. Information and evidence that raises a serious risk of injury to the national security or danger to the safety of a person can only be withheld from the named person. The judge must ensure throughout the proceedings that the minister does not cast too wide a net with his claims of confidentiality. In conclusion, the IRPA schemes requires an incompressible amount of disclosure to the named person and the named person must be reasonably informed of the minister's case throughout the proceedings. Moving on to the next case. In the case of Gallant versus Canada, a prisoner is referred to as G was notified of his transfer to a higher security prison based on allegations of involvement in extortion, threats of violence and drug importation. The notice given to the prisoners was drafted in general terms and did not provide more specific information to protect the identity and safety of the informants. G applied to the federal court for an order quashing the transfer decision and it was granted on the ground that the notice was insufficient. The deputy commissioner appealed the decision. The court noted that the requirements of procedural fairness, like those of natural justice, vary with the circumstances. In this case, the lack of more detailed notice was due to concerns of safety of the informants. The court found that the circumstances were sufficient to relieve the obligations to provide a more detailed notice. However, the decision to transfer the prisoner to a high security prison also raised a Section 7 charter violation as it deprived the prisoner of his liberty. The court found that the decision was not made in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice, as the prisoner was not given a real opportunity to answer the allegations against him. Finally, the court considered Section 1 Charter issue, which asked whether a law giving such a wide discretion to penitentiary authorities was reasonable in a free and democratic society. The court allowed the appeal, set aside the order of the federal court and upheld the transfer decision, as it was reasonable to confer a wide discretion on penitentiary authorities in such a society. Moving on to the next case, Mission Institution versus Kela. In this case, the focus was on the jurisdiction of provincial superior courts in reviewing the legality of a federal inmate's transfer from a medium security institution to a maximum security institution. The main question before the court was whether a provincial superior court could rule on the reasonableness of an administrative decision to transfer an inmate to a higher security institution or whether the reasonableness of an administrative decision must be dealt by a federal court through an application for judicial review. The Supreme Court of Canada held that a provincial superior court may assess the reasonableness of a transfer decision through an application for habeas corpus. The court noted that habeas corpus is a flexible writ and its jurisdiction is concurrent with the federal courts for allowing a review for lawfulness that sometimes requires an assessment of the decision-maker's reasonableness. The court further noted that many principles support concurrent jurisdiction between provincial superior courts and the federal court, including the right of each applicant to choose their avenue of relief. The fact that there is no reason to presume that federal court is more expert in determining the lawfulness of a deprivation of liberty and non-discretionary nature of habeas corpus. The court stated that a transfer decision must be within the range of possible, acceptable outcomes, defensible in respect of facts and the law and must have justification, transparency and intelligibility to be considered reasonable. The court also stated that a transfer decision may be procedurally unfair if it involves the duty of procedural fairness owed to the inmate, including the duty to disclose all relevant information. In this case, the court found that the transfer decision met by the statutory requirements of the duty of procedural fairness was therefore unreasonable. In conclusion, Supreme Court of Canada ruled that a provincial superior court may rule on the reasonableness of an administrative decision to transfer an inmate to higher security institutions through an application of habeas corpus. For those who haven't read the constitutional law, this power specifically belongs to the federal courts. That is the reason why this became a question of debate. Moving on to the next case of Go versus Canada, National Parole Board. The statute in question required the National Parole Board to either rely on information and disclose its source or forego its use altogether. 
the board relied on the section 17 subsection 5 of the parole regulations and never disclosed the detail of the alleged incident or the names of the victims that led to the revocation of G's parole. G appealed to have the revocation quashed, claiming that it violated his right under Section 7 of the Charter. The court allowed the application and the matter was referred back to the federal court for a resumption of the hearing. The court held that the non-disclosure by the board is justified by Section 17, Subsection 5 of the Parole Regulation but the board still needs to provide enough information to allow the individual to answer the allegations. The court argued that the rules of fundamental justice require that an individual is entitled to know the case against them in decision-making process that leads to a diminution of their liberty. However, the individual's right to liberty weighs heavily in the scales compared to competing interests. The court also held that Section 17, Subsection 5 gives the board discretion to withhold information, but it must still be prescribed by law and proportional to the purpose for which it was designed. In conclusion, the court held that the board's discretion to revoke G's parole without giving him enough information to answer the case against him violated Section 7 of the Charter and ordered the board to provide necessary information. Moving on to the next case, in the case of Kiki Taluk Corporation v. Nunavut, the Kiki Taluk Corporation was an unsuccessful proponent in the requests for proposals issued by the government of Nunavut for the provisions of medical boarding home facilities and services in Iqaluit. On November 9, 2008, the Kiki Taluk Corporation initiated an appeal with the Contracting Appeals Board set up under the Nunavumi, Nunavumi, okay, let's just call it NNI policy. Okay, so on November 9, the Kiki Taluk initiated an appeal with the Contracting Appeals Board set up under the NNI policy of the government of Nunavut. The Kiki Taluk Corporation requested disclosure of information related to the decision-making process, but the board did not respond and ultimately concluded the appeal after denying the request. The legal issue in this case revolved around the requirement for the board to follow the principles of natural justice and procedural fairness and the disclosure of confidential information submitted by the proponents. The court declared that the board was bound by and must comply with the rules of natural justice and procedural fairness and that its decision of December 17 and 22, 2008 were a violation of application's right to be heard. The court also set aside the decision and referred the matter back to board for reconsideration and determination. The court recognized the importance of confidential business information submitted by proponents but emphasized that the board must follow the principles of natural justice and procedural fairness in making its decision. The board's failure to provide a response to Kikitaluk's request for disclosure and follow its own procedure was a violation of application's right to be heard and constituted a failure to observe the principles of natural justice and procedural fairness. Moving on to the next case, in the case of Toshiba Corporation versus Anti-Dumping Tribunal. Toshiba sought a review of a decision made by Anti-Dumping Tribunal. Toshiba argued that the tribunal relied on two reports that were prepared by its staff and not disclosed to the parties. The Federal Court of Appeal dismissed the appeal. The judge who prescribed over the case made a distinction between two reports prepared by the tribunal staff. The first report was preliminary report prepared prior to the commencement of public hearings and the second report was prepared after the hearings were over. The preliminary report was not disclosed to the parties and consisted of facts that directly implicated the ultimate issue the tribunal was called upon to decide. The judge stated that this was a dangerous practice but also determined that everything in preliminary report was either a matter of general or public knowledge or based on the facts that were properly brought out at hearing, allowing the parties to test them. He concluded that while there might have been a technical breach of natural justice, it was minor and inconsequential, and the outcome of the inquiry would not have been different even if this breach had not occurred. The judge took a different view on the final staff report, which was a summary and the commentary on the evidence and the submissions made at the inquiry. He deemed this as a proper part of the tribunal's 
staff functions and did not require it to be disclosed to the parties. The final report was simply part of tribunal's internal discussion making process for which tribunal was alone responsible. The judge concluded that the final report should not even form part of court's record. It was worth noting that the judge's statement regarding the second report was later challenged in subsequent cases. The next case of Trans-Quebec and Maritimes Pipeline Incorporated versus National Energy Board, the Federal Court of Appeal in 1984 was asked to determine whether staff papers prepared for the National Energy Board should be disclosed to the parties. Trans-Quebec, the applicant, sought leave to appeal two decisions of the NEB, National Energy Board, and applied for disclosure of any staff papers prepared by the board. The Federal Court of Appeal dismissed the application. Justice Thurlow stated that if it can be shown that the decision of a tribunal was based on staff reports to which the parties did not have access and the reports contained evidentiary materials to which the parties did not have an opportunity to respond, it may be possible to make a case of a disclosure. However, in this case, the applicant failed to make such a case. The court held that the analysis and the opinion in staff memoranda are irrelevant to the assertment of the board's reason for decision because they cannot be assumed to have been adopted by the board. The board's reason for decision are those which it chooses to express or which can otherwise be clearly shown from its own words or actions or have been its reasons. This decision was later challenged in later cases as the court's statement on staff reports was found to be not absolute. The issue of confidentiality of staff reports and their potential impact on the impartiality of tribunals remains a contentious one. Moving on with the admissibility of evidence. Admissibility of evidence refers to the process of determining whether evidence can be used in administrative proceedings. This process involves evaluating the relevancy, authenticity and reliability of the evidence. The rules of evidence used by courts do not necessarily apply to agencies. However, the rules of natural justice still apply and limit the discretion of agencies over the admissibility of evidence. What are the rules of natural justice? We have spoken about the rules of natural justice quite many times now. But what are they? These rules require a fair and impartial hearing and agencies must not remove the right of affected parties to have a reasonable opportunity to present their case. This means that agencies must consider all relevant evidence and they cannot disregard evidence that may be helpful to the case of the affected party. Hearsay evidence may be admitted, but exclusive reliance on it could lead to a breach of rules of natural justice. Hearsay evidence is a statement made outside the court by a person who is not present to testify. While hearsay evidence can be admitted, agencies should be carefully not to rely solely on hearsay evidence to make their decisions. In summary, the admissibility of evidence is a crucial aspect of administrative proceedings and agencies must ensure that they follow the rules of natural justice and consider all relevant evidence to make fair and impartial decisions. Moving on to the next case, in the case of New Brunswick versus Bond Management of Board, the legal issue the legal issue was admissibility of evidence in an arbitrator's decision to sustain the dismissal of an employee for sexual assault. The victim did not testify and the arbitrator relied solely on hearsay evidence of what the victim had told others and opinion evidence. The New Brunswick Court of Appeal set aside the arbitrator's decision stating that relying solely on hearsay and opinion evidence was not sufficient to meet the requirements of natural justice. The court held that the type of admissible evidence must be proportional to the severity of the outcome to the party. In this case, given the severity of the allegations and the sanctions, the court concluded that the arbitrator's decision to rely solely on hearsay and opinion evidence was disproportional. The ratio of this case is that the requirements of natural justice deemed that the admissibility of evidence must not remove the entitlement of the affected party to have a reasonable opportunity to make their case. The use of hearsay evidence must also be proportional to the outcome of the case. In summary, the New Brunswick versus Bond case highlights the importance of ensuring 
that the type of admissible evidence used in a case is proportional to the severity of the outcome on the party. The case also emphasizes the need to uphold the requirements of natural justice and ensure the admissibility of evidence does not remove the entitlement of the affected party to have a reasonable opportunity to make their case. The next case is Ray Clark and Superintendent of Brokers, Insurance and Real Estate. The legal issue in this case was whether the Superintendent of Brokers, Insurance and Real Estate acted properly in admitting the transcripts of evidence given by Mrs. Jackson at a criminal trial and then attributing little weight to it. Clark had surrendered her license as a real estate salesperson when she was charged with theft and fraud in connection with the sale of home owned by Jackson. After being acquitted, she applied for the reissuance of her license, which was held by the superintendent. However, Mrs. Jackson's health did not permit her to attend the hearing and her transcripts of evidence were admitted by the superintendent. The court held that the transcript evidence of Mrs. Jackson was admissible and the superintendent in admitting the evidence and giving it legal weight made no error in law or in fact. The court explained that the board may properly attribute less weight to the evidence that is not normally admitted in the court. This is because the rules of evidence used by court do not necessarily apply to agencies, but the requirement of natural justice still apply and limit the discretion of agencies over admissibility of evidence. The ratio dissidenti of the case is that the discretion of the board and tribunals over admissibility of evidence is subject to limits, such as the requirement to provide a reasonable opportunity for the affected party to make their case, but it is not necessarily bound by the usual rules of evidence. Additionally, the court may recognize the admissibility of evidence that is not normally admitted in the court and attribute less weight to it as appropriate. In summary, the Ray Clark and Superintendent of Brokers, Insurance and Real Estate case highlights the importance of discretion of board and tribunals over admissibility of evidence. This discretion is a subject to limits such as the requirement to provide a reasonable opportunity for the affected party to make their case, but it is not necessarily bound by the usual rules of evidence. Additionally, the court may recognize the admissibility of evidence that is not normally admitted in court and attribute less weight to it as appropriate. The next case is the Ray Toronto Newspaper Guild and Globe Printing. In this case, the legal issue was whether the refusal of cross-examination of the person presenting application to the Labor Relations Board was a denial of basic justice. The court decided that it was indeed a denial of basic justice and that the most effective way for the company, Globe Printing, to test the merits of the application was through cross-examination. Cross-examination is a process of questioning witness in a legal proceeding. It is an essential part of legal system because it allows for a fair hearing. In this case, the court established the ratio that the right to cross-examination is a fundamental aspect of natural justice and must be granted in order for a fair hearing to take place. This decision was affirmed on appeal and the importance of cross-examination cannot be overstated. It allows for the parties involved to test the evidence present and to challenge any inconsistencies or inaccuracies. Without cross-examination, the credibility of the evidence presented would not be tested and the decision would not be based on a fair and just hearing. In conclusion, this case established that the right to cross-examination is fundamental for a fair hearing. It is an essential part of the legal system and ensures that the justice and fairness is upheld. Moving on to the next case of Incifil Township versus Vespra Township. In this case, the Supreme Court of Canada was asked to determine whether opposing municipalities were entitled to cross-examine an official of the ministry who presented a letter to a statutory authority. The court noted that the cross-examination is a vital element of the adversarial system applied in the legal system. It allows parties to test the evidence presented and to challenge any inconsistencies or inaccuracies, as we have discussed in the previous case law. The court emphasized that where citizens' rights are involved and the statute affords them the right to a full hearing, including a hearing of their demonstration of their rights, one would expect the clearest statutory curtailment of the citizen's right to meet the case against him through cross-examination. However, the court also recognized that the procedural rights of parties before a tribunal 
can only be determined by reference to the tribunal's parent statute and other relevant statutes prescribing procedural norms. Therefore, a court would require the clearest statutory direction to limit or restrict the right to cross-examination. The next case law is Ray County of Strathcona No. 20 and McLab Enterprises. In this case, a group appealed a decision by the Provincial Planning Board to rezone a developer's land from agriculture to urban. The group argued that they were not given the opportunity to cross-examine all the evidence presented by the developer. The court held that a person appearing before a quasi-judicial body is entitled to be heard and to present their case and that the denial of this right would constitute a denial of natural justice. However, the right to cross-examination is not absolute. The court could quash an order made in proceedings where the right of cross-examination was limited as long as the person was given an equally effective method of answering the case made against them and the requirements of natural justice were met. In this case, the developer's counsel asked the board to accept a report from Dr. Bernhardt who had conducted a study of pollution in the area. However, Dr. Bernhardt was not available for cross-examination as he was in Germany at that time. The board ruled that the report be admitted and the respondents could file answers to any points raised in the report. The respondents filed two documents, one by Dr. Turk and another by Dr. Klippinger that answered the Bernhardt report. The court held that the absence of the report's author and the inability to cross-examine went to the weight to be given to the report, not its admissibility. The court found that the respondents had taken full advantage of opportunity to correct or contradict any statement in the Bernhardt report. In conclusion, the court held that restrictions on ability to cross-examine may be permissible as long as other alternatives are furnished to the parties and that fairness is maintained. It is important to note that the right to cross-examination is not an absolute right but a fundamental aspect of natural justice that must be balanced against other factors in the legal system. Now let's discuss the case of Ray B and Catholic Children's Aid Society of Metropolitan Toronto. In this case, JB challenged the decision to deny his application to have his name removed from the Child Abuse Register. The main legal issue in this case was denial of natural justice due to lack of cross-examination opportunity of the alleged victim, Haley B. JB's counsel argued that the decision was based on hearsay evidence and was not tested by cross-examination. The court held that the admission of hearsay evidence without the opportunity for cross-examination did amount to a denial of natural justice in this case. The court found that the decision of hearing officer and the director was based on hearsay evidence of June Demat, who reported the complaints and later denials made by Haley B and that JB was denied the right to cross-examine the alleged victim. The decision in this case emphasizes the importance of cross-examination in ensuring fairness in legal proceedings. The court held the potential severity of the outcome of an individual is proportional to the board's decision to offer cross-examination as an alternative. In this case, the denial of cross-examination opportunity was deemed to be a denial of natural justice and the court concluded that admission of hearsay evidence without cross-examination constituted a violation of JB's right to a fair hearing. In conclusion, the case of Ray B. and Catholic Children's Aid Society of Metropolitan Toronto highlights the importance of cross-examination in ensuring fairness in legal proceedings. It emphasizes the significance of right to cross-examination and demonstrates that the denial of this right can constitute a denial of natural justice. Moving on to the next case, Jakovic v. British Columbia. The petitioner, Mr. Jakovic, sought judicial review of three separate decisions of the Workers' Compensation Appeal Tribunal, WCAT. The central issue was that WCAT breached the petitioner's right to procedural fairness by denying him a full and fair hearing. The court held that the duty of procedural fairness embodied in the maxim of audi altrum partum had two components, the right to know or understand the case to be met and the right to respond to that case before the decision maker reaches a decision. The court considered several factors in determining whether WCAT fulfilled this duty. 
including the similarity of this process to the court's process, its role within the statutory scheme and the importance of its decisions. The court concluded that WCAT did not breach the petitioner's right to procedural fairness. Court found that the hearing process used by WCAT was fair and the decision-making process was thorough and reasoned. The court also noted that the hearing process was similar to that of a court and that WCAT played an important role in the statutory scheme. In conclusion, the case of Jakovic v. British Columbia 2010 highlights the importance of procedural fairness in legal proceedings. It demonstrates the duty of procedural fairness includes the right to know or understand the case to be met and the right to respond to the case before the decision maker reaches a decision. The case also highlights the factors that courts consider in determining whether the procedural fairness has been fulfilled. Let's discuss the next case. Manitoba Limited OA London Limos versus Genius City Taxi Limited. This case involved an appeal from the decision of the Taxi Cab Board which granted additional licenses to London Limos over the objection of two taxi companies, Unicity and Duffy's. The legal issue in this case was whether the failure of the board to provide information and reasons to the objectors amount to a breach of the duty of fairness and the rules of natural justice. The court determined that the objectors had to request reasons before they could complain of a breach of natural justice. However, failure to request reasons will not always bar the application of review and in this case it did not. The board proceedings and hearings were recorded and transcripts were available which acted as a sufficient and adequate surrogate for board's reasoning in the circumstances. The court found that the board's decision was reasonable and should not be interfered with and dismissed the appeal with costs to London limos. The test applied by the board was the public convenience and necessity contained in the act and evidence and submissions were directed towards the board. In conclusion, this case highlights the importance of providing reasons in legal proceedings. While failure to request reasons will not always bar the application of review, it is important to ensure that the duty of fairness and the rules of natural justice are fulfilled. This case also demonstrates the importance of evidence and submissions being directed towards the applicable test, which in this case was the public convenience and necessity contained in the Act. Moving on to the last case, final case of this chapter and everyone after this can take a breather, especially me because my mouth, my jaw is hurting. So for this reason only, I should, I deserve a like and a subscribe if you're not only already not subscribing my channel. Also hit the bell button or whatever that thing is, all, all that you do on YouTube. I'm not a YouTuber, so just do all that stuff while I finish this case. So in this case of Wall versus Independent Policy Review Director, the legal issue was whether the Independent Policy Review Director provided adequate reasoning for not proceeding with the complaint made by Jason Wall against police officers involved in his arrest during the G20 summit. The court held that the Director failed to provide adequate reasoning in accordance with the principles of procedural fairness. Section 60, subsection 7 of the Police Services Act and the duty of procedural fairness at common law require the director to explain the basis of the decision and apply his mind to the consideration of whether it is in the public interest to proceed with the complaint. The director's brief and generic statement was deemed inadequate to meet this obligation. The court quashed the director's decision on the grounds that he failed to provide adequate reasoning for his decision. In conclusion, the case of Wall versus Independent Policy Review Director emphasizes the importance of providing adequate reasoning in accordance with the principles of procedural fairness. It is essential for the decision makers to explain the basis of their decisions and apply their minds on considerations of whether it is in public interest to proceed with a complaint. Failure to provide adequate reasons may result in a decision being quashed as in this case. Thank you for being with me throughout this chapter. I really appreciate it. And I really appreciate it if you go ahead and press the like button like I requested. Uh, subscribe if you're not already subscribing. Share it with your friends. Share it with the other NCA candidates. I am doing all these classes for you for free. Absolutely no money being charged here now or maybe ever for the classes. 
However, you can always visit my website for more content such as my notes and my exam workshops if you're interested. Uh, if you're not, still, if you like what I'm doing, just press the like button, subscribe, press the bell icon so whenever there's an update in the syllabus while you're still writing exams or for the next exams that you're going to write, you will get notifications because I will be I will keep on updating the coursework, the material as and when the NC updates it on their website. So see you in the next class. The next class we will be talking about the content of procedural obligations from an unbiased and independent decision maker's point of view. See you there. Bye bye.